2 Corinthians 11, let's learn about that serpent, all right? Let's learn about the serpent. Be wise. Have understanding. Um, know the enemy. Understand how he works. Understand his beguilements. Understand his subtlety. Just how subtle is he? Paul said in 2 Corinthians 11, 1, Would to God you could bear with me a little in my folly, and indeed bear with me. For I am jealous over you with godly jealousy, for I have espoused you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. But I fear, <clears throat> lest by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your minds should be corrupted from the simplicity of that is in Christ. For if he that cometh preacheth another Jesus, whom we have not preached, or if you receive another spirit, which ye have not received, or another gospel, which ye have not accepted, ye might well bear with him. We've gotten to the place in our lesson where, uh, take your Bible, turn to 2 Kings 18. 2 Kings 18. And uh, we could go to the book of Numbers too. We might do that. But let's get a little bit of understanding here. The serpent, Paul mentioned, called, Paul could have used, I guess, a lot of phrases. He could have said Satan or the devil. Uh, he could have called him by a lot of names. But in this particular case, he mentioned him as the serpent. We found out from Revelation 12 that when we're dealing with the serpent, we're dealing with. Uh, the dragon, where he is called the devil, the devil, because he is in a group of devils. Uh, devils are evil angels. That's what they are. They are of the angelic realm. They are evil in their nature. God created them that way. All right? Understand that. God created them. He the Bible says that God created light, He created darkness, He created good, and He created evil. The Bible specifically mentions that He created evil. What's the purpose of creating evil? Man doesn't have a choice, but he has evil to choose from. Okay? Um, if you remember years ago, back in communist China, remember the, remember the Mao days in China? Everybody dressed the same. Everybody rode the same kind of bicycle. They ate the same kind of food. Everybody, that was communism at work. That was communism, full-fledged communism at work. Now China's different. It's still communist, which means they take all the money, but they let people have a little bit of their own way, do their own thing, dress their own way, and so on. Uh, but anyway, where was I? I lost my track already. I need a little bit more coffee in me to keep my mind straight. Uh, let's see here. What was I talking about? Oh, the, huh? Yeah. I don't remember. Anyway, <laughs> that's, a, that's, that's God's cue that might get in the Bible, all right? 2 Kings chapter 18. Uh, the background on this is back in the book of Numbers. The people complained and murmured against Moses and against God. Even though they had seen all of these great miracles God had done. And I want you to ponder this. You may have seen God do some good things in your life, but you have not seen God open up the Red Sea. You didn't see that. You have not seen manna on the ground waiting for you to collect it every morning. You have not personally seen that with your eyes. You have not seen a pillar of cloud by day, a pillar of fire by night. You have not seen all these things, yet you read about them and you believe them. All right? You believe them. Believe it or not, that makes you a little bit greater than the people who saw them with their own eyes. Because that's what Jesus told uh, Thomas. He said, blessed are they who have not seen and yet believe. I have not seen those things, but I believe in them. I believe them exactly the way the Bible says. I was going over some things about the flood and Noah's ark last night. And naturally, there is 
scientific objection to a worldwide flood and the fact that Noah carried all of these animals on the ark. They say it's not possible, and so therefore the Bible must be wrong. Okay? Well, that, that kind of plays with your head a little bit. And I'm not saying that I had this big doubt moment, but it's one of those things where I read something that said the Bible was wrong, and I thought about it for about one-tenth of a second and said, no, the Bible's right. Amen? The Bible's right. I believe what the Bible said. Okay? And there's a, I'm going to teach on this tonight. Uh, it's, it's in the queue of the notes that I have. I don't know if I'll get to it tonight. But God, Noah did not put every representation of every animal on the ark. He did not put, as far as dogs are concerned, he did not put schnauzers and boxers and dachshunds and shih tzus and all that. He did not put that on there. He put two dogs on there. Two representations. Because the Bible says after their kind. And kind, there's seven classifications of the animal kingdom. And the family order, the family classification is what was on the ark. There were two dogs. And from those two dogs came wolves and dachshunds and schnauzers and dingoes and wild dogs in Africa. Those are, boy, those are wacky to watch. If you see YouTube videos of these wild dogs in Africa, they'll run in packs and they'll kill an animal and they'll tear it completely down to nothing in a matter of about 15 minutes. I mean, they're, they're bad fellas. But out of these two dogs that was on the ark came a representation of they were carrying the genetics of every other class of dogs in the world. So you only need two on there. Uh, and that goes with all that stuff. Um, but anyway, that Bible's right in everything that it says. And so Israel, they murmured and complained against God because they've seen all these miracles and yet they're still complaining. All right? And so God sends fiery serpents among them and they, they were bitten by those serpents and they were dying. Many of them did die. And so they, they pled to Moses. Moses, please do something. And uh, so Moses called unto the Lord. God gave him instruction to build a brass pole and a brass serpent. Brass is a symbol of fire. Think of the color of brass. Okay? The color of brass and fire is very, very similar. So brass is a symbol of fire. On there, so he builds this serpent of brass and on a pole of brass. That is a picture, it's a foreshadowing of Christ. Okay, Jesus said, As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. And the symbolism of that is, is that Christ on the cross, taking on the form of our enemies on the cross, making a show of them openly, de defeating them and destroying their power on the cross. The power of Satan in your life is not defeated by your thoughts. It's not defeated by your own will. It's not defeated by you practicing or exercising certain things. He's defeated by the cross and only the cross. Amen? So, Moses had this serpent on this pole. And the Bible said that if they would look upon this, that if they had been bitten... They would be cured of the venom that was in them. Remember what venom of a serpent is in the Bible. It's doctrine. It's false doctrine. It's lies. A forked tongue. Venom comes out of their mouth. Lies comes out of their mouth. The lies of Satan, the serpent, in Genesis 3 came out of his mouth. And so even now, bad doctrine, bad Bible doctrine is always against the cross. Always. The cross represents you being powerless against your own sin. The cross cures you of that. And only the cross cures you of that. Amen? So, think about where we're going with this. Another Jesus, another spirit, and another gospel. Is the, is the end game of the serpent. This is where he's taking everybody. 
He's not leading anybody to the real Jesus. He never will. He will lead them to another. And he did not say Buddha. He did not say Joseph Smith. He did not say Muhammad the prophet. He did not say any of these other characters. He said Jesus. A different Jesus. That's where he's leading everybody. He's going to lead them with a different gospel. Therefore, the lies that Satan tells are always going to lead away from the finished work of the cross. And when they lead away from the finished work of the cross, they will lead people to performance-based blessings or performance-based salvation or performance-based grace or whatever you want to call it. Works, salvation, or whatever. Legalism is another term of it. But it's always where you must do this or perform this before God can give you anything, before God can bless you, before God can save you. Whereas the pure Bible, the pure doctrine of the Bible teaches you that since you cannot do anything to satisfy God, and you never have, you go to Him with a contrite heart, Christ's sufferings on the cross satisfies the just demands of God, therefore we are saved and we are blessed by the cross and nothing else. How I many of you ever had a financial miracle in your life? Sure you have. That was the cross. God gave that to you because you didn't deserve it. Else, if you deserved it, then it's not a gift. God would just owe you something. God doesn't owe you anything. I almost said it the redneck way. God doesn't owe you nothing. Okay? God doesn't owe you anything. All right? So anyway, that's the whole deal of it. So watch this. This brass serpent on this brass pole, after the book of Numbers, we don't know what happened to it, but apparently they kept it. And they saved it. Then all of a sudden now, 2 Kings chapter 18, let me open my Bible there. Let's get the gist of it. We'll get into the context of it. 2 Kings 18. Now it came to pass in the third year of Hoshea, son of Elah, king of Israel, that Hezekiah, son of Ahaz, king of Judah, began to reign. Twenty and five years old was he when he began to reign, and he reigned twenty and nine years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Abai, the daughter of Zechariah. And he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord, according to all that David his father did. And he removed the high places, and brake the images, and cut down the groves, and he break in pieces. I mean, I'm going to stop right here. Wouldn't it be something that we had a, a governor in Missouri or a mayor in Festus or a county executive in Jefferson County that decided that idol worship just wouldn't do. And he sent teams out and went in everybody's yard that had a statue of Mary in a flower bed and took a big sledgehammer and broke, it to pe broke the statue to pieces. And then took big clippers and clipped down all the flowers and plants around it. And turned around and walked away. And left a sign there and said, we're not going to have this in Jefferson County. <laughs> Woo! Amen! That man's going to have enemies. They're going to run him out. Okay? Mm -mm -mm. So that's what he did. He just... He just Sent teams out wherever they saw one. They busted them up. And if anybody complained about it, they said, this is by authority of the king. So that's what he did. And then, verse 4 again, he break in pieces the brazen serpent that Moses had made. For unto these days the children of Israel did burn incense to it, and he called it Nehushtan. He trusted in the Lord God of Israel so that after him was none like him among all the kings of Judah, nor any that were before him. For he claimed to the Lord and departed not from following him, but kept his commandments, which the Lord uh, commanded Moses. But anyway, he, they had been worshiping and burning incense to this brass image of the serpent. They were, they were bowing before, uh, here I'm going to say this, they were worshiping a crucifix. They were worshiping a crucifix. Woe be the day that our county hospital sold out to the Sisters of Mercy. 
Because the moment they did, Mercy Incorporated went through on, on the orders of whoever runs that convent. Mercy Incorporated went through in every office, every hallway, in every patient room. They put a Nehushtan in there. A crucifix. A cross with a dead God on it. That is not Jesus. That's not Jesus. Okay? And it doesn't work against vampires either. I don't know who made that up. Doesn't work. Okay? That is a dead God on a stick. God said, do not worship. But you know, every Roman Catholic, when encountering those, they will stop, they will bow, they will genuflect, and they will cross themselves, and maybe in some cases say a little prayer. That's idol worship. God said, don't make them, and don't bow to them, and do not pray to them. God said, don't do it. And you want, makes you wonder how then the Catholic Church, or in some cases the Lutheran Church, or in some cases the, some of these other, what they call um, mainline churches, mainline denominations, how they have these statues and bow and pray to them, how they get away with that. Well, I know how the Catholic Church does it. In their catechism, they omit the second commandment. Take it out. Where God said, thou shalt not make unto thee any graven images. Okay? So that leaves them with nine commandments. Well, then they take the tenth commandment and divide it in two. Number nine is... Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house. Number 10, thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife or anything that belongs to thy neighbor. So now they still have 10 commandments, but that is in their catechism. Now in the Catholic Bible, I'm reasonably sure that it still has, thou shalt not make unto thee any graven images. No. But who is a Catholic that reads the Bible? No, it doesn't, Pastor Mike. They took it out of the Bible? Really? Huh. See if you can find that on the internet somewhere, Todd, okay, before 1040. Can you do it? Oh, okay, you don't have it with you. All right, anyway, because uh, that would be interesting to me, okay? But anyway, that's how they get away with it. They just take it out. They don't believe it, so they take it out of the Bible and say, well, that sh should have never been there, okay? And anyway, that's how they, so what, here's the idea behind this. The serpent will always demand worship. He will demand that you worship Him. Now watch this now. Worshiping by commandment is not worship. Because God tells us in the New Testament that we're to worship Him in spirit and in truth. Which means you do it out of a willing heart. If you're going to worship God... You worship God because you want to worship God. You worship God because you recognize that He has done things for you that you now have things that you are blessed with that came from God. You recognize that. You fall on your face before God. You weep and you cry unto God and say, God, thank you for what you've given me. That is worship, God. And you do it out of a voluntary, free heart. Satan demands a ritual that honors him, but it's done by commandment and not by choice. Do you see the difference? Okay? God wants your worship, but he wants you to do it out of a free will and a free heart. Amen? He doesn't want a bunch of fake, phony ritualism that is in the name of God, where the, the leader says, okay, now everybody do this, now everybody do this, now everybody do this, now say these words, now bow to this, now eat this, and all this stuff, and they're doing it because they're commanded to do it. But they're just doing it, going through the ritual, going through the form, going through the motion. They don't believe, they don't have to believe, they don't, none of that stuff. And so they're just performing a ritual out of commandment. The devil will command worship. Demand worship. 
bow before me. God says, I want you to bow before me because you want to bow before me. Do it out of a free heart. Matthew chapter 4, turn there. Matthew chapter 4. Jesus being tempted in the wilderness by Satan himself. Well, I like this. I like the analogy. In the Old Testament, Eve was tempted and failed the temptation. In the New Testament, Jesus was tempted and passed the temptation. He was tempted, yet without sin, the Bible says. Matthew chapter 4, verse 9. He saith unto him all these things. Let, let me back up and get the context. Verse 8. Again the devil taketh him up into an exceeding high mountain. See that word exceeding high? That phrase exceeding high? You know what that means? It's above high. Okay? Now, the other gospel writers, one of the other gospel writers says, where he showed him all the kingdoms of the earth in a moment of time. All right? Um, I don't know if I'd want to get into this too far. The devil took Jesus to a place beyond our three dimensions. Okay? That's what the phrase exceeding high mountain. It exceeded high. It exceeded the bounds of our three dimensions and took him to a higher realm to show him all the kingdoms of the earth in a moment of time. Now my personal idea is is that it was all the kingdoms of the earth throughout all of time from the beginning of the creation until the end of the world including future kingdoms. Showed him all of them. Every one of them from all of earth's history in all of earth's places. He showed him all. That's just my personal opinion. But anyway, showed him all the kingdoms of the earth in a moment of time. Okay? So he says, see him? And he offered him to him. All these things. Verse 9. Will I give thee if thou wilt fall down and worship me? Then saith Jesus unto him, Get thee hence, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. Somebody say amen. amen. Don't bow to the crucifix. <clears throat> Don't bow to the statue. Don't regard the idol. Don't regard the image. Don't do anything like that. We have a cross in our church. I believe in that. It does not bear the image of any man, any beast, any creature, anything. It is simply what the cross is, an empty cross. Christ was taken down off that cross, put in a tomb. Three days later, he rose from the dead, and he's not ever... See, the emptiness of that cross means he's not going back again. He's not... Watch this now. He doesn't need to be crucified again for any more sins of mankind. He was crucified for all of the sins of mankind, past, present, and future. Christ died 2,000 years ago, but for whose sins did he die? Yours. Sins that he had not even committed because he wasn't even, well, he was close to being around, but not quite. Okay? He hadn't even been around then, and yet Christ was crucified for, for all of his sins, okay? Anyway, uh, anyway, it, 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 thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. Isaiah chapter 14. Let me show you this. I'm going to take just a very small little journey around the world they, where they worship the serpent. In, when Cortez landed in Mexico, he found out that they worshipped a god by the name of Quetzalcoatl. Okay? And the translation of Quetzalcoatl is a plumed serpent or a serpent that had feathers. 
wings. And it just so happens that in your Bible, Quetzalcoatl is identified. Isaiah 14, 29, Rejoice not thou, O Palestina, because the rod of him that smote thee is broken. For out of the serpent's root shall come forth a cockatrice, and his fruit shall be a fiery, flying serpent. A flying serpent. Now the fiery serpents are what was came into the camp of Israel where the uh, image was made. Alright? The fiery serpents. Is it possible that those were also flying serpents? It's, it's possible. The Bible doesn't say, but it's possible. Let me ask the question. Do you think there ever was in earth's history fiery flying serpents? Sure there was. Sure there was. Pterodactyls are flying serpents. The, the word serpent in the Bible refers to the reptile kingdom and pterodactyls were Reptiles that had wings and could fly around. All right. Um, incidentally, Quetzalcoatl. You see the image up here up on the screen. Quetzalcoatl was known as devouring humans, devouring humans, consuming them. Is that possible? There are pythons in this world right now, big enough to choke and devour. Helpless humans. They found them. Dead people inside of a python. Okay? So it's, it's possible. It is within the realm of possibility. Alright? So your Bible can be believed. Fiery flying serpent is not outside of the realm of believability. And I think that this verse here deals with... It says that the serpent's root... And the serpent's fruit is a fiery flying serpent. I think that this is a reference to the Antichrist, the beast, that spirit that rises up out of the uh, out of the pit, out of hell, and he and he takes over the world. The world's ruled by a beast, and and when they make this image of the beast, the image demands <laughs> one thing: that everybody worship him. Because Satan, the dragon, gave him his power and his seat and great authority. And so that image of the beast says to the world, Worship me or I'll cut your head off. Okay? Demands worship. Uh, in, um, in Mexico, the Aztecs or somebody built a pyramid. Now this fascinates me. Because if you look up on the screen, at the notice that pyramid there on the, let's see, it'll be on your left. Down at the very bottom of that stairway that goes up to the top of the pyramid, down at the very bottom, they carved out of stone a dragon or a serpent with his, with his mouth open. On June 21st of every year, they built this pyramid so that on June 21st, which is what? Does anybody know what that is? Summer solstice. Summer solstice. On June 21st, you see how the sunlight hits one face of that pyramid. Well, it casts a shadow over against that stairwell. Notice the shadow. And the, the idea is a serpent is descending down from heaven to earth. I know what that is. Jesus said, I saw Satan fall. How? Thank you. As lightning. Look at it. Looks like lightning, doesn't it? Okay. I saw fate, Satan fall as lightning from heaven. Revelation chapter 12. And the dragon was... Listen, he's not descending down from heaven. He got tossed out. Amen? How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? And to this day, on June 21st, this area, this is called Chichen Itza. 
First time I heard it, I thought it was chicken pizza. <laughs> chicken pizza. To this day, June 21st, people go to this pyramid and they do exactly what the Aztecs did 600 to 1,000 years ago. They worship this image of the serpent coming down on the summer solstice down to the earth. They do the same thing. Revelation 13, 4. And they worshiped the dragon, which gave power unto the beast. And they worshiped the beast, saying, Who is like unto the beast? Who is able to make war with him? He commands worship. He demands worship. He wanted Christ to worship him. Christ refused. You know what I think that means? I think that all who are Christ should also refuse to worship him. Don't thank the devil for anything. Don't ask the devil for anything. Do not give him, by the way, do not give him more credit. In fact, don't give him any credit. And don't believe in your mind that the devil has more power than God does. The charismatic doctrine, the word faith doctrine says that... Um, God is powerless and God lost authority on earth to the devil. Man gave the devil authority over the earth when he sinned in the Garden of Eden. So therefore, God cannot perform any miracle in your life until you release God by your faith-filled words. You speak the magic words and then God is released to have more power than the devil does. That's a lie. That, that right there, to me, is giving the devil credit and giving him authority where he really has no authority. If God doesn't want the devil to do something, the devil doesn't do it. He said, well, I don't know if I... Job chapter 1 and Job chapter 2. God gave the, the devil limited authority over Job, but he limited it... And the devil responded to that. The devil knew the bounds that God placed him in. God was not going to let, the first time, God was not going to let the devil touch Job's physical body. The second time around, God was not going to let the devil take Job's life. Wasn't going to let him do it. You tell me who's got power and great authority. Somebody say amen. amen. You keep that in mind. You keep that in mind. The next time you're being harassed by devils, and they will, that you cannot be, as a born-again Christian, you cannot be possessed by devils, but you can be oppressed by devils. The word press there. They, they can press on you. They can weigh down on you. They can harass you. They can intimidate you. They can scare you. They can make you have feelings that you don't like. But they cannot make decisions for you. And I've seen church people believe in their mind and in their heart that the reason why they do certain sinful things Activities is because they have a devil in them and that devil needs to be cast out. Once that devil's cast out, they won't have any more sin nature. I don't want to do that for a minute. We got a sin nature. Somebody say amen. amen. Job 26, 13, by his spirit he hath garnished the heavens, his hand hath formed the crooked serpent. Ecclesiastes 1 15, that which is crooked cannot be made straight, and that which is wanting cannot be numbered. In the night sky. Um, you have a cluster of stars called Draco. Draco is the Latin word for dragon. And it's interesting because this cluster of stars moves and they're, they're just kind of, they're, it's a line of crooked stars and this cluster of stars moves in the night sky around the north star. Okay? It circles. It's like the roaring lion going to it, walk, you know, walking to and fro, seeking whom he may devour. And uh, a lot of times you will see people facing the north 
and worshiping. I think in, in my mind, I think in Ecclesia, or excuse me, Ezekiel chapter 8, there's something about them facing the north. I can't remember it, but anyway. The idea that the dragon, the, the serpent, must be worshipped. Then let me read this, and then we'll close it for today. Isaiah 27, 1. In that day the Lord with his sword and great and strong sword. What is the Lord's sword? Thank you, Scotty. It's the word of God. How many of you ever got mad at the devil? Because of something he did. Something he took away from you. Something he messed with. Something he stole. I have. Oh, I've been mad at him. Punishing. Get a sword out. Get the Lord's great and strong sword. And punish Leviathan, the piercing serpent. Piercing. What are, this, what are his fangs like? They pierce. Even Leviathan, that crooked serpent, and he shall slay the dragon that is in the sea. You want the devil punished? You want to put, if you want to put the devil in absolute terror and misery, get your King James Bible out and start reading it. And believe, don't read it like some vampire exorcist would read these magic words to make these vampires go away. Read the word of God and believe it. And it's okay if you even want to say it out loud. I'm not saying you have to. I'm just saying it's okay if you just want to say, listen to me, devil. I got something I want to read you. I've done that before. Okay? I'm not saying you have to. I'm just saying you want to make the devil put him in a bad mood. You want to punish him. You want to make him go away. Do what Jesus did. Start quoting scripture to him. Start quoting scripture to him. He'll leave. He will leave you alone. All right? Philippians 2.15, that you may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God without rebuke, in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation, among whom ye shine as lights in the world. What I'm doing here, I'm setting you up for what's coming next week. Okay? Lost people. Who, are, who, is, who is the father of all lost people? Who is their father? Okay? The serpent is. He's their daddy. They are of their father and the devil. Generation of vipers. All right? You used to be. You used to be. And God saved you. And now God is your father. Amen? Father in heaven, thank you for your word. Thank you, Lord, for revealing these things. Open up our eyes. Teach us wondrous things from your law and your statutes and your judgments. These things never change, and we thank you for it. God, this Bible is our eyes to be able to see into a realm that we cannot with our physical eyes see. But we see, Father, through the words that are in our Bible. We see into the spiritual realm, and we see how the dragon works. We see what he looks like. We see how he can be identified. We also see, Lord, how he can be run off. We see that he does have power, but that power is limited. So, Father, bless and honor your word, we pray in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen.